Let's see what the Lord has for us today. Go ahead and stand and and open your Bibles. Let's get right into the Word today. I want to continue to talk about prayer. Matthew chapter 6. We have been talking about uh, a, a series here on prayer called When You Pray. And last week we talked about developing a habit of prayer. Hopefully you are been practicing that. You've been de- developing a habit and a new habit, changing up your habit. When was the, sub- was the th- uh, word we picked last week? When do you pray? And the, pr- and the answer is all the time. But we're only going to do that if we have a habit of prayer. So we talked about having a habit of prayer. Habits form our life. We schedule our lives around our habits. We need a place regularly that we go to that we can meet with God. That that is our altar. You need an altar. Tell the person next to you, you need an altar. If you don't know what that means, that just means a place where you can meet with God, that you can get away from people, you you can you can unplug and you can just give your undivided attention to the Lord. You need to uh, develop a habit of doing that every day. We talked about that. Today we're going to talk about you. Everybody say you, me. And he's going to talk about uh, the heart of prayer. Last week was the habit of prayer. I'm going to talk to you about the habit of prayer. And I love the more we talk about prayer, the more we will develop an appetite for prayer. Man, when I read books about prayer and I read what Jesus said about prayer and I hear about other people's prayer life, doesn't that kind of get you uh, wanting to pray more? See what happens? And so it's an atmosphere of wanting to go after God. Well, Jesus addresses the heart of prayer, and I want to pick it up in chapter 6 of Matthew, only two couple of verses today. Verse 5, he says, And when you pray... You shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the churches, and on the corners of the streets, so that they may be seen by men. I certainly I say to you, they already have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who is in the secret place will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. I want everybody to hear this. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you even ask Him. You need to know that today. God already knows the needs that you have before we even ask Him. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. You have saved this teaching of Christ for us to learn and to apply to our lives today. And I pray that you will speak to our hearts again today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thanks, Pastor Steve. The heart of prayer. Hallelujah. How many remember, I was thinking about this, how many remember your first crush? (laughs) <laughs> how many remember the first time you had a now some of you got to go way back okay i don't know but uh how, how many how many remember that uh, first piece of advice you got on how to approach this said crush might have been a a sibling uh a relative that tried to give you some pointers maybe you watched um uh, you know something on tv and got some some lines or whatever you learned but uh you know, the big thing about having a crush back in the day is you got to find out if that other person has a crush on you, right? And so uh, it might have came in the form of a valentine or, or, or maybe one of the piece of papers. Check the box if you like me. Uh, check the box if you want to go out. How many remember that day? Okay, remember that? All right, so I was thinking about this. I, I've had crushes since kindergarten. Amen. Pray for me. Amen. I did. Uh, it's kindergarten. Miss Mooney, school two, e-course was my first crush. But when I was about 12, I'll just say this. Uh, how much do I want to embarrass myself, Lord? Uh, when I was about 12 years old, uh, my f- best friend and I, you know, Kevin, uh, known him all my life. He, uh, we went to uh, St. Francis Dance uh, in E Course. Mom, you may be finding this out for the first time. I, I spent the night with Kevin, but this is where we went. Amen. So, <laughs> confession time. <laughs> and so we snuck there anyway. So and uh, so yeah, Amen. I forgot you were going to be here today. And so, uh, <laughs> okay, so anyway, and we're standing there, and I look over, and there she is, okay? I'm not going to say her name because people watch. 
went to a dentist office. Let me give a shout out. I promised I would a couple of weeks ago in Allen Park. And I walked in and a lady across the desk seen me and goes, Eddie Markham? And I was like, yeah. She said, I'm so-and-so um, Trevino. She's uh, the Trevino family. I grew up with her and she recognized me even without my hair and everything. I was like, whoa, I ain't, see, ain't seen her in 20 years. And told her about our church, and she said she's going to watch online. And I said, I'm going to give you a shout-out. So shout-out to the Tally Dental people over there in Allen Park and to the Trevino family, if you're watching today. God bless you. Amen. People started coming out of the back room. The uh, relative of the owner of Loveland's supermarket works there, and all these people from the neighborhood. And so uh, giving a shout-out to all of you. Amen. God bless you. So people do watch. Uh, so I won't tell you who this crush was I had, but she was cute. She's beautiful. And uh, so I had two problems, though. One, she was taller than me. Uh, and two, I couldn't dance. Uh, and so I could break dance. Hey, I could bust a move, but you don't do a windmill at that kind of dance. And so <laughs> my, my wingman, Kevin, said, I got you, bro. So we went into the bathroom, and he began to put paper towel in my shoes and, um, to help me be taller. And... and <sighs> And back in the day, there was things that were in fashion, and one of them was a bullet necklace, okay? I know, it's a, or dog tags. And so he had these bullet things, and, you know, we're trying to, like, impress. He's, this is a chick magnet, man. They love their, you know, bullet necklace. I'm 12, okay? So, and I don't know how to dance. So he's teaching me how to dance, and, and he's doing all this, and, man, he's telling me what to do. And so I come out of the bathroom, paper towel in my shoes, bullet on my neck, and I'm looking for this girl. And uh, I couldn't find her, and I'm saying, you know, what am I going to say to her? And then I get a tap on my shoulder, I turn around, and there she is. We're almost eye to eye now. <laughs> and she says to me, you want to dance? Lo and behold, she had a crush on me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I had a little problem. I had more paper towel in one shoe than I... <laughs> this is a football injury, babe. You know, it's a... <laughs> Back to the scripture. Jesus is actually teaching us in these verses how to approach God the right way in prayer. And just like, you know, that girl had a crush on me, I did not even know it, but the Lord just wants me to tell everybody right here when we talk about prayer, before we go any further, that God desires you more than you desire him. I want you to know that about prayer. It's not something we got to work and be. I want you to know that God Almighty, who designed you and created you, he desires to be with us more than we desire to be with him. And Jesus is teaching us here the right way to approach God. He's saying you don't have to be pretentious. You don't have to put paper towel in your shoes or a bullet around your neck. You don't have to try to be somebody you're not. You don't try to have to be all religious when it comes to prayer. Jesus says it's not about all of that. It's about coming to God and wanting to be and desiring him over duty. You're wanting desire to pray with him. You want to be in his presence. So the first thing that I want you to write down from this today is a few things as I look into this story that God teaches us about approaching God in prayer. And it's about having the heart or attitude of prayer. And that is this. Prayer isn't just for communicating, but for communing with God. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. The first thing out of the gate is that, listen, guys, prayer is not just for us to run in there with a laundry list of things that we want him to do and then to run out. It's not about communicating, although we do bring our requests made up to God, but didn't you read a few minutes ago? He already knows what we have need of before we even ask. Why did Jesus say that? Because he's saying it's not about giving him your list. He just wants to spend time with you. It's about communing with him in prayer. I want you to look at this verse in verse six. It's on the screen. Look. How many times the word you is in this verse? Jesus says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, not Pastor Eddie's God, not the Pastor Paul's God, not the Pastor Steve's God, your Father, your Father. Everybody say, he's my Father. He, he's your Father. Jesus said, he's your Father. He's not just for the, the Levites and the Pharisees. He's your father. 
your. This is the only verse out of 31,000 scriptures in the Bible. This is the only one with seven pronouns. And all seven pronouns are one, you. And it's all about you and God in prayer. I think that's intentional. I think Jesus is saying, I want you to know that when it comes to prayer, it's not about everything else. It's about you and God. And then I love what stood out to me was, by the way, he is in the secret place. I love that. He didn't say before he said he sees you, before he hears you. No, no, no. Jesus said the first thing I want you to know about prayer is that he is in, he's in the secret place. He is in that habit that you are developing for prayer, that place you go and you pray. Jesus wants us to know he is in there. Why? Because he's saying he wants to be with you. He wants to commune with you. You know, the Pharisees, in the, in the very beginning, I know we're kind of hard on them, but you know they were actually the very first people to experience the Holy Spirit. They're in the Old Testament. They were the 70 elders in the book of Numbers. They were the 70 elders of Moses. And they were the first ones to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And, and they came to Moses and said, Moses, these guys are full of the Holy Ghost. And I thought that was only reserved for you. And Moses says, I wish all of you would experience the Holy Spirit. But you know, over a couple of thousands of years, especially during the 400 years of silence in the Bible, They went from the leadership and the elders to form this sect called Pharisees. Pharisees were born during the 400 years of silence when God wasn't moving and doing any miracles. What happened? They began to lose their ability and drift from their first love in spending time with God and communing with the Holy Spirit. And they became religious pious, and they made prayer a religious ritual instead of a relational practice. Hear me today. That's huge. That's a huge difference right there. And that's Jesus' whole, in fact, the whole chapter, Jesus is talking about the attitude in the heart. He says, not only when you pray, but when you give, don't let your left hand see what your right hand gives. Don't blow a trumpet when you give, because the Pharisees that actually literally, when they wanted to give alms to the poor, they would stand and blow a trumpet. So that those that are in need would come and know that he's gonna, they would give gifts to you if you were poor. But Jesus said they're really doing that to be seen. Jesus said when you give, don't let your left hand see what your right hand's given. In other words, it's an attitude thing. I'm getting ahead of myself. But we can drift from that. I, I come across this story. It's amazing. You might have heard about it. There's this lady. She's called the phone lady. And she makes $480 an hour to teach people how to communicate on the phone. Her name is Mary Jane Copps, and she says the younger workers grew up primarily texting. So they actually lack the phone conversation skills and uh, have developed a phone phobia. It's like a real thing. Because they're so used to texting, they haven't been used to talking on the phone. Now, I prefer text myself. Amen? Amen. But you still got to talk on the phone sometimes. And so this woman gets paid $480 an hour for a one-on-one session. She has helped 15,000 Gen Zers to overcome their phobia and the skills needed to hold interviews and to do jobs. She also charges $365 for a 30-minute webinar. And corporates are hiring her for workshops going as high as $3,500 a day. And she is booked up to the end of 2023 already. I just wonder to bring it in today if I am concerned that we are losing our ability and our skills to be able to sit in the presence of God and not just shoot him a text and, and say, God, I need this and pray, bless the food. No, I think we have lost the ability to sit in his presence and commune with God. Jesus is showing us how to do that, and he's not even charging us $480 an hour. Do you know this is our number one calling? Look, he says in 1 Corinthians, the great apostle Paul, he says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship 
with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He has called us into fellowship. The word fellowship is kononia. It means, to, it means closeness. It means to share one's intimate thoughts and feelings, to commune. This is what we're called to do. We sometimes make the mistake of our calling and our assignments. I've, I've had two conversations this past week about this, and I'm going to probably talk more about this on Vision Sunday, but uh, I've taught it before, and I was, this young man I'm mentoring is asking about his calling. That's a legitimate uh, request. I, you know, talk, something I talk about, we all want to know what has God called us to do, and I begin to explain to him how it is in the Bible. Actually, what we're called to do is to be with him. That is your calling. That's what the scripture is. That's what Jesus is getting about. Your calling is to be with him. It's not what you do for him. It's to be with him. What we do for him are our assignments. And let me tell you something. Your assignments will change, but your calling will never change. Your calling is to be with him. After Jesus called his first disciples and he, he picked them out. The Bible says the very first thing he did, it says, and he called his disciples that they would be with him, number one. They would be with him. This is our, now our assignments will change. My assignments have changed from the very first time we got involved in ministry and, and serving. I, and I remember so clearly I was in church and I was praying, God, what do you want me to do? I'm fasting and seeking God. Do you want me to be a uh, pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, a prophet, an apostle? Fivefold ministry, Ephesians. Look it up. It's there. And we always go to the fivefold. Uh, you know, you'll never have someone. God, should I join the cleaning team? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> we pray for these, right? I was, yeah, me too. And I'll never forget. God spoke this to me so fast, right during the. Uh, Worship, sir. You know, God will speak to us sometimes, most of the time, for me, in worship. And I was praying. I was sincere. Oh, God, pray. What, what do you want me to do? You want me to be one of these? You're calling me into the ministry? And this is what he said. He said, Eddie, I've called you to be a servant. I know that was God because I would have never thought that with my prideful self. It was like, right out of the left, be a servant. So we begin to go to work and be a servant and find out what God is and to serve where he was. But here's what I want you to know about being a servant. And the Lord says, you, you, have, uh, you serve many people, but you only have one master. And I learned that, that what he means by that is you've got, you got one priority in your life, and that is to be called to me in prayer. This is your calling, is to commune with me. And I would say public, private prayer needs to proceed public ministry. Private prayer needs to proceed public ministry. That's why I think a lot of leaders and a lot of people have fallen is because not as they quit doing what they're doing, but they quit spending time with Jesus. They quit being with Jesus. And the Pharisees quit doing it. That's how they drifted. They quit meeting with God as Moses did. They quit spending that time with him. Jesus is saying, hey, your father is in the secret place. He is waiting for you. He is waiting for you to meet with him. He's wanting to commune. He's wanting you to fellowship, to let him know your intimate feelings and, and to tell him what you're feeling and what you're struggling with. And, and it's okay to tell God, listen, I'm struggling with my unbelief, as the man told Jesus. And Jesus didn't condemn him, right? He healed his child anyway. He's wanting, that's what communing is, is to be with him and to say, God, this is what I need to. I am called to be in your presence. It's about communing. Then Jesus goes on and he tells us, and we learn also from this, is that motives matter when it comes to prayer. This is the main teaching of this whole chapter for Jesus and his disciples. That motives matter when it comes to prayer. It doesn't matter how loud you pray. You pray. It doesn't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter if you pray in King James. It doesn't matter if you pray with Scripture. It doesn't matter how you pray, what you pray. What matters to God is our motives, our heart, and the attitude of who we are and why we are there is what matters to God. Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites. I mean, he starts off his teaching with a negative instruction. Don't be like them. Don't be like them. For they, they are hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites. They love to pray to be seen by men. 
Now listen, there's nothing wrong praying in public. I want you to know that. That's not what he's saying here because Jesus prayed in public. The apostles prayed in public. And there's many times we're called to pray in public. If you're the only Christian in your family, you're probably asked to pray over the food every holiday service. Amen. You know, and, then, you, and that's fine. And that's, that's, that's okay. I pray in public all the time in the township here. It's fine. That's not what he's not saying that is anything wrong. But when we pray with a pious or we're praying, you know, to be pretentious and to be with this prideful heart, that is what he's saying. It's the motives. But not only is he in the secret place, but I love this part. Jesus says, your father, I want you, want you to know that your father sees you in the secret place. He is in the secret place, but he says, I want you to know that he sees you in the secret place. The word see there, it is not to see like you may think it means. It actually means to take notice. How many know, especially us men, we could be staring at something right in front of us, but we just don't notice it. (laughs) The old joke is is that Adam and Eve in the garden, that Eve found the tree because Adam would have never found it. I mean, I don't, that's probably true. But there is a difference between seeing, right, and noticing. And Jesus says the Pharisees do it, just to be seen by people. But if you want to get noticed by God, if you want to be noticed by God, this also tells me that if I have the right heart, that being noticed by God should should matter more to me than being noticed by people. In other words, how God sees me should matter more than how people see me. If I'm, if I'm hearing you right, Jesus, if, if I'm hearing you right, the people at work think I'm crazy because I take my only day off and I go to that church and, and I worship. They, they think I'm crazy because I, I lift my hands and I, I read my Bible every day and I, and I go and I pray and I give and I support missions and church and, and that's what I do with my extra time. I've even taken vacation time, precious vacation time, and I've went on mission trips and, and I've given it back to the Lord. People, and people may think I'm crazy. But God, it doesn't matter how people see me. What matters is how you see me. So, Lord, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. Then you're developing that right heart. Jesus said this is what gets noticed by God, is when we have the right heart. This confirms exactly what Isaiah the prophet said. Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 66 says this. He says, These are the ones. This is God speaking through this man, Isaiah, the prophet. And he says, these are the ones that I look on, that I notice. Same word there, with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Please, if you don't remember anything today from this service or from this entire series on prayer, please remember this scripture. Snapshot it, record it, write it down. This is the heartbeat of God when it comes to our our spiritual disciplines to God. This is what he looks for. He's not looking for experience. He's not looking for all of that. He's looking for the attitude of the heart. But he says, humble, contrite, and tremble. Let me break these three down for you real quick. Humble. Humble. What is humility? I've talked about it before. Humility is not an expression on our face. Humility is not a couple of emojis after our text. Emoji isn't isn't just the the way that we do. No, no, no. Humility is an attitude of the heart. It's a self-awareness that we we can't do anything without God. It's a self-awareness of our frailty. It 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 is part of the story we tell ourselves in our mind that we don't deserve this, but... You know, it's not like, I deserve this. That's what we tell ourselves sometimes. No, humility tells ourselves, I don't deserve this. Jesus told a whole parable about the Pharisee again, the Pharisees. Always, Pharisees are always the object lessons of what not to do. And the tax collector who would not even lift his hand and, or his head to pray to God. Remember that story? And Jesus says, which one of them left the house of God justified? Was it the religious man that said, God, I thank you I'm not like this sinner? 
But the sinner, the Bible says, would not even lift his hand or his head to God, but he kept his head down and said, God, I don't deserve anything you've given me. Jesus said, that's the one that gets your father's attention because he's humble. That's, that's humility. And we all gonna wrestle with that because we all have pride in our flesh that's in your fallen nature. It is there, but pride is something that is very, more deadly than I think we realize. Pride made a devil out of an archangel. Just think what it'd do for you. It will totally turn us around and get us out of the way. It'll block our prayers to God every time. You can be fasting, you can be praying, you can be meeting with God regularly and your prayers are bouncing off the wall if we haven't learned to humble ourselves in, in this art of humility. But let's move over to contrite because Isaiah is kind of painting a picture there. We kind of know what humility is. If you don't, I just defined it kind of briefly for you. But broke, contrite is the big one here. It means to be broken before God. Broken in a good way. It means to be broken, kind of like, like a horse is broken, right? I love horses. We have people here in our church that have horses, and uh, horses are beautiful. They're awesome. I've always went horseback riding. I think that's why God gave me bow legs. Amen. It's natural. And so uh, we would go, but I remember one time we went uh, horseback riding on vacation, and uh, years ago, a few years back, and Melinda and I went to this place where they let you go to the trails, you know, and, and go. Uh, they don't have to fight, lead you, nothing wrong with that, but I love to just go, right? Because I, so they led us to the trail, and I got this beautiful paint horse, gorgeous. Her name was Starbuck. I still remember. I'll never forget this horse because as the lady is leading both of us out to the trails, Melinda's got this beautiful brown, uh, dark brown, light brown mane, tall, it's big, beautiful, and she's just, you know, going, it's beautiful. I got this thing, and I get to the gate right before they let, put us into the, the trails. Well, the guide leaves us and says, okay, I'll be back in an hour. You pay by the hour. We only got an hour. Soon as the lady leaves, Melinda goes into the gate, and I'm like, come on, and my horse just stopped. She knew, well, she didn't feel like riding that day. And I said, oh, I've got to show her, you know, my, my wife's watching. <laughs> there I go again. I grab the reins, come on. She jumps up like Tonto or what's the name of that? Goes up like the Lone Ranger. I mean, and boom, hits the ground. I'm like, <laughs> she's laughing at me. I'm still rolling. I mean, she's laughing. Her horse is going. I'm over here having it out with this girl. I'm going to show her what's up. I'm from E-Town, baby. So I grab her and I smack her hard. Come on, get in there. She goes up and starts. <laughs> and we're, if we had cameras, <laughs> boom, she hit that ground. Finally, I get her to go in. That was the worst hour of my life. We didn't even go in deep into the trails. We, we go right back to the entrance. She, and the lady comes with a guide to get us. My horse starts going. And I told her, I told her what happened. She goes, oh, Starbucks been known to do that, but you said you had experience, so I gave you that horse. I'm like, she says, that horse didn't want to go on those trails, and she recognized the posts of where it was going. She knew what you wanted her to do, and she didn't do it. Here's the thing spiritually that Isaiah is telling us. When it comes to being used by God, unless we are broken before God, he's not going to use us. A horse, as wild as it is, as beautiful as it is, but it, unless it is broken, it will never be used by God. Let it just run wild in the woods. But if you need it to pull a cart, if you need it to work, it needs to be broken. And once that animal is broken, and he's, God's not a mean God wanting to break our hearts. This is what he's wanting to do. Prayer isn't about being, humili being humble and contrite. It isn't about God breaking our hearts. It's about God breaking our will. Please get that today. God is not wanting to break your heart. He's wanting to break your will. What did Jesus pray in the garden? Not my will, God. I don't want to go to the cross. I'm not sure, God, if there's another way. That's what that was. But when our will is broken before God, you can put a seven-year-old on the back of that animal. And that, animal, and, and, and that little seven-year-old girl can just take those reins and go, and that big, massive, strong animal will just go wherever you want it to do. There are people in churches all over the place, Christians that are trying to do things for God and get into that next level of ministry, but God says, I can't use you because you haven't learned this one principle. 
You're still trying to do everything your way. I'm trying to help us today. Saul was a guy that did it, but he wanted to do it his way. We need to get to the place where we are like, God, not my will, but your will be done. Can I go a little further with this? King David was in his prayer closet, his secret place, praying with God about this very thing. And God actually looks at David, and he tells David in Psalm 32, he says to him, he says, Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Next verse. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Let me go a little further with this horse thing. You know, David is saying, I need to be broken before God. God said, I actually want you to get to the place where I don't even have to put a bridle on you. And I don't even have to have a tragedy hit you here. I don't have to have you get laid off from work for to get your attention. I don't have to have your, your life being sick before you start coming to me. Don't wait until life begins to, these things happen and I got to jerk you over here and jerk you into the church. Get to the place where you know where I want you to go by the way I look at you. Shoo. Oh, that's my prayer. That's my prayer. God, I want to be, what is he saying? He's wanting to be so sensitive. Being in the secret place will make you and I sensitive to the call and the tugging of the Holy Spirit. You don't spend time in prayer. God, you, God never answers my prayer because you're, you ain't doing this, brother. Have you stopped and spent time? Some of you still haven't got that habit of prayer. I know, I know y'all. First 45 minutes in bed, you're going through Instagram, you're going through TikTok, you're going through Reels, you know, and then, God, i got to go on and go over my day. You know, they're not wrong. Look at it later. You want to look at a cat fight a horse? Look at it during your lunch break. But start the day with saying, God, I need a secret place. Why? Jesus said, because God's waiting on you in the secret place. God is waiting on me there. He's waiting for us in the secret place. He's not waiting on the street corner. He's not waiting for when we stand in front of the church and give a prayer. I wish Pastor Eddie would let me pray because I can pray. I say thee and thou and I pray in King James. Amen. I don't know. It may be somebody. God says, man, I want you to get to the place where I can guide you with my eye. How do you, what does that mean? That means when you are focused in on my face. Because when do you see an eye? When you're focused in on my face. David, don't focus on my hand. What I can do for you, focus on my face. And when you really get to know somebody, you can just tell by the look on their face what they want you to do. Come on, married people. Even parents, you look at that kid and you see that kid with that expression, get that, my mom would be like, get that expression off your face. You're going to take the trash out and love it. <laughs> You're going to do the dishes and be smiling and thanking me for it. Right? That's how mamas are. You better, you know, it's attitude. It's, it's looking. And God is saying, I want to be so close and you be so close to me that you know what I want you to do, not by having these circumstances come to you like this. And the last thing was the fear of God. This is, this is so important. This is the, the heart of the message is these three right here. Humble, contrite, and tremble at my word. This is what Jesus is teaching us. This is how you approach God. This is how we, we you want to get God answer our prayer. I'll explain that in a minute. Well, let me just give it to you right here. This is, this is one of the main points of the whole thing. Prayer from this passage, we learn, we don't pray to convince God of our will, but to understand his will better. That's what he's saying here in this thing. Prayer isn't about getting in your prayer closet and fasting for that matter too. It's not to try to convince God of what we want. It's not about convincing God, this is what I want. No, 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 Jesus said that's not, that's the Pharisees do that. No, no, this is a prayer, it's about getting, alone. this is the heart of prayer, it's getting alone with God and learning what his will is for your life. And if it's too hard to do it, then pray for understanding that God will help you do what you know God wants you to do. Whew. This is where the fear of the Lord comes in. That's what he means by tremble at my word. You put that Isaiah scripture back up there, please. It says, and tremble at my word. I could go three hours on this. This is called the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is something I think is missing so much in our society today. 
The fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God. It's being afraid to be apart from God. That's what the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is, oh, I'm scared of the guy upstairs. That's, that's not the kind of fear God. Fear, the fear of the Lord means reverence. When I'm on that horse, I better have some reverence for that horse. I, well, fear means respect. And, and, and it's that respect that is a healthy respect. You see these people climbing these mountains, these Mount Cliff climbers? You remember Sylvester Stallone in and, and that one movie, <laughs> Cliffhanger? Okay, I'm from the 80s. I'm sorry. Crazy, these guys go up a side of a mountain with just chalk on their hands, these little shorts, rope. I ain't, dude, let's play football. I ain't doing that. <laughs> the craziest things, they go up the wall. But you know what? If you, if you listen to these interviews from these professional cliff hangers and climbers, they'll tell you part of the secret is, is having a healthy fear of falling. Not to the point where it paralyzes you because you won't be able to go up the side of that mountain. But you have to have a healthy fear of falling. It actually motivates you to be clear-headed and to pay attention and to engage in every move that you make. God is saying when it comes to the person that gets my attention, it's when, when they talk to me, when they live for me, they are actually wanting me. I got their undivided attention. And they want to do anything I tell them to do. They tremble at my word. You find this in Abraham. God told Abraham something that God never does. And he says to give me your son Isaac. Sacrifice him on the mountain. Abraham knew that God doesn't, he's not down with human sacrifices. But you know what it says in the very next verse? It says, and Abraham got up early the very next day, took his son and went to the mountain. There was no, I got to fast three days for this. I got to get a confirmation, two confirmations. I got to have him tell me a pre service prayer. I got to have this. I got to find where I got. No, Abraham was the guy that trembled at his word. We find out later in the book of Romans that Abraham knew that even if he did kill his son, that God would raise his son back up. He was so convinced and so trusting in God, even when it made no sense to do what God has told him to do, he still got up the very next day and he trembled at God's word. He, he feared God's word. Listen, we got to fear God's word, man. Like, I love the prophetic, but this has always been my rule. I will never say, thus says the Lord, unless I know that I know that I know that it is thus says the Lord. And sometimes I've missed God because I've been so afraid of that. And that's an that's a error, too. You, you got to use faith when you prophesy. Man, but I take it serious, man. When you are praying for people, and I realize my position as a pastor, I give spiritual counsel to families and people. And when you say, God told me, I don't want to get too far off into this, but church, let us... Let us make sure we got a lot of people that prophesied a lot of crazy stuff over the last couple of years. Don't get me going on that. Send me, you know, look at this guy. Well, brother, the Bible says the word's got to come to pass. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? It, 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 they're, 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 and I pray for that. It's the fear of God that keeps us from this kind of error. I'll never forget, and then I'm going to start to close. Years ago, we, uh, John Brevere wrote about this, actually, in one of his books, Heart Ablaze. I recommend it's an old book, Heart Ablaze, but it's a powerful book about having a heart of God. And uh, sometimes those old books are good, right? I ain't read it in a while, but it's good. But I'll never forget the story he told about Jim Baker. Y'all remember Jim Baker? Some of y'all may not remember Jim Baker. Jim Baker, Jim and Tammy Baker were the founders of this ministry called PTL, and they were TV evangelists. And um, my cousin and family actually worked there at the uh, amusement park in Carolinas. And, and uh, it was a huge ministry. Back in the day, there wasn't as many as we have today. There was like only like three or four uh, that were really big. But uh, Jim Baker was this guy on TV and, you know, he asking for money. To, and everyone thought they were supporting uh, orphans or something he was in. Uh, anyway, he got caught embezzling money. And it's a horrible, horrible, horrible story. He was having an affair of course, the news got a hold of it, and it's just a sad, um, unfortunate event that happened in the church world, okay? And that's what happened to this guy named Jim Baker. He went to prison. And I'll never forget, uh, John Brevere went to go visit him, and he said that when he was visiting him, he talked with Jim Baker, and he said, Jim, I just got to ask you something. He said, 
all the time I watched you guys on TV and you, you always talked about the love of God and, and, and you would, you would you know, invite people to know Jesus and you seemed to have it down packed. And, and all this time, all this time, you were behind the scenes and, and, and you, know, you were doing this. I just got to ask you as a pastor, man, when did you stop loving Jesus? Like, like I need to know this because I'm you know, coming up in the ministry and John Brevere was just really getting his start. And he said, I, I, I want to know, like, what can you tell me? When did you stop loving Jesus? And he said, before he could finish, he said, John, I never stopped loving Jesus. I stopped fearing him. This right here is exactly why he said that it is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs says, is the foundation of any Christian person. You won't be able to be living these kind of loose lifestyles out here and say, if you have a healthy fear of the Lord. It's a fear of the Lord. You won't even make these decisions without God. Is it you? Because my fear is not afraid of God, but I'm afraid to be a part of God. I'm afraid to be in my own will and not in his own will. That is the fear of God. Woo, hallelujah. This is gets God's attention. Thank you, Lord. Closing for real right now. And this is what I told Pastor Steve. I wanted to not preach as long, but I wanted us to end in a minute. And I want to, let's just still do this. Let me skip over the fasting and that. Worship team, why don't you guys come? This is what I want us to do, praying about how to do this. The last thing Jesus mentions is he talks about reward. He talks about if we, if we have this kind of heart, if we have this kind of heart, as I've been preaching all morning, that God will reward us in the open. And so having a right heart for God is when we, when, write this down, when the rewards of God matter more than the praises of men. When we live our lives uh, because the rewards of God mean more to me than the praises of men, then we are developing a right heart. Jesus said he will reward you openly. And I was going to give you all the rewards that God lists in the Bible, but I'm going to do that. Let me just sum it up by this, by telling you this is the best reward that Jesus said we get in the secret place. Are you ready? It's God. God himself is the reward. I will reward you in public. What's he say? That means when you go to work, people's going to notice that you're different because I'm with you. When, you. when you are around those other people that you used to hang around with, it's going to be like First Peter. Well, they will think it's strange because you no longer do the things you used to do. Why? Because my reward is upon you. You will have favor upon your life. You will be able to do things. You know, I wish we would do a better job in telling our kids what we are for than what we are against. You know, if we would tell our kids, not you can't do this, you can't do that, I understand it. But if we would just get into the habit of saying, kids, this is what you can do. You can go into your secret place and you can commune and meet with the God of heaven who has your whole future already planned out. You can meet with him. He's waiting for you. What would happen if we would do that? a better job at that. God is waiting for us right now. Can we just practice this right now and close out this service with us for your Monday instead of developing a habit, develop a heart for prayer. And let's practice by doing that right now. Let's put the notes down. It's not about information at this point. It's about experience. Can we just reset our heart right now? Reset our heart to God and begin to just, I just want you to know God is waiting for you in the secret place right now. Can I encourage you to get into your secret place right now? I know it's, full, it's a room full of people and, and, and you don't want people to look at you a certain way. Listen, it's not about people looking at you. It's about the audience of one right now. And, and we're going to worship and just continue to sing. And let's just do that. Let's end this service today with us getting into our secret place right now. God is waiting for us. God is waiting for us. God is waiting for us. Come on, you want to stand? You want to kneel? You want to come up front? Come on, go, come on. Let's, let's break the ice. Let's do it. Let's do it. Look, come on. Preaching's over. Come on. Let's, let's worship. Let's get into that secret place right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just you and God. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Yes, come on, get in that seat. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us. Oh, Lord, we need to be humble. Broken. And tremble at your word. Maybe your prayer is right now, God, restore the fear of the Lord in my life. Left it. Jesus. Come on. Come on, church. Come on, River of Life. Come on. I know it's Sunday. Come on. Can we just do this right now?